Goldilocks sat in the great big chair. It was too hard. She sat in the middle-sized chair. It was too soft. She sat in the baby chair. It was just right, but it broke when she sat on it. <clears throat> that is a capsule history of chair design in the Western world. Does it matter? It appears to matter very much. If the world is a stage, then all designers are set designers, and the chair is the basic prop. It is certainly our basic artifact, even though, or because, it has nothing to do with basic survival needs, food, shelter, and clothing. The chair is the standard advanced problem for design students and a major challenge for professionals. There has, to my knowledge, never been a world chair shortage, yet although the need for still another chair has not yet been established by the Surgeon General, an astonishingly large number of designers go on designing chairs. No designer is so maladroit and inept that he cannot make a satisfactory chair, yet few have created chairs that are handsome, sound, comfortable, and helpful. When a designer creates a chair that is original in concept, it is enough to make his reputation for a decade. If it is possible to sit in it with anything less than acute pain, this is a bonus. Architects in particular find chairs challenging. Mies van der Rohe, Eero Saarinen, Marcel Breuer, Le Corbusier, Frank Lloyd Wright, Alvar Alto. Designers search for the right chair solution, like biologists hunting for a cancer cure. And they are not alone. A standard exercise in traditional philosophical inquiry has to do with determining whether or not a chair is real. Why a chair? Thoreau lived at Walden Pond in a cabin furnished chiefly with three chairs. One for solitude, two for friendship, and three for society. The chair dominates our language as it dominates our environment. Our ways change, and with them our diction, but whether a group has a chairman or a chairperson, the symbol lingers on. Folksy, pull up a chair. Formal, please be seated. Mr. Abercrombie will see you soon. My father distrusted certain novels and movies, because in them people said, Won't you sit down? My father didn't believe that people really said that, except in books or movies, and in his experience no one ever did say it. On the other hand, he could have accepted, sit, sit. The chair recognizes you, and we recognize the chair. During the Watergate hearings, the Department of Justice wondered whether it was legally possible to arrest a sitting president. One of the highest university offices is a chair. Consider the witness chair with the witness situated high enough to be displayed to the jury and spectators, yet low enough to be intimidated by the lawyers. The placement of chairs is one of our oldest forms of gamesmanship. Have you ever had a job interview in which the prospective employer sat beneath you? The role of the chair as an element in human interaction is relatively unstudied. Not to worry. What we need is not research, but awareness. You can easily do informal studies of your own. Try taking Polaroid pictures of your living room before and after a party. Many rooms will look quite different. Some will look almost the same, except for peanut shells and glasses and filled ashtrays. It depends a lot on the kind of party giver you are. If the furniture has been radically dislocated, then the usual configuration of your living room furniture is not the same as that for a party. But if the furniture is not out of place, what is the message? That you are always ready for a party? That the furniture is too large to move? That the party was dull, or at least remarkably static? Or that it was a stand-up party? If it was a stand-up party, it is worth asking why. No thanks, I'd rather stand, may be a revealing statement. There are social occasions in which guests are afraid to use the chairs, just as presidential candidates Carter and Ford during their first television debate were afraid to use the Eames bucket seats that forlornly accompanied them. Even during the 27-minute audio failure, neither candidate sat down. To be sure, sitting down would have been a cumbersome process because of the cord running from the throat mics to the audio equipment, but sitting down is a position of trust, like turning one's back, and these were two men not in a position to trust each other or themselves. If Ford had sat down, he would have lost the advantage of being taller than Carter. Also, sitting down means having to get back up again, risking a fall from gracefulness. Such concerns, dramatized in a national event that was otherwise devoid of any dramatic interest, affect us all, almost every day. 
Each of us has been in rooms in which some people dominate the conversation, not only because of who they are, but because of where and how they sit. We have all seen people unable to get into a conversation because of where they manage to place themselves. We have all been in that situation ourselves. A very deep, large lounge chair is a good place from which to deliver nuggets of wisdom if you are being lionized at a gathering, but is a very bad place from which to try to get a word in edgewise if no one is dying to hear it. We have all been stuck in the immediate environment in which we first placed ourselves, or in which an obliging hostess has placed us. It is impossible to furnish a room intelligently without taking this kind of thing into account, and that is one reason for the variety of chairs we seem to need. To some extent, the placement of chairs is not entirely our doing. Products contribute to the design of other products, and products contribute to the design of the spaces in which they are used. Television is a very powerful design influence. Until its advent, there were very few rooms in which the chairs faced the same way. Chairs used to face other chairs, or a sofa, so that people could talk with or look at one another while they listened to the radio. With television, the American living room has been transformed into a convertible theater, and the design of chairs for theater is not the same as the design of chairs for reading. Which leads us to consider function. Many classic chairs are stubbornly functional. In one of the myriad Bauhaus declarations, Gropius wrote, in order to create something that functions properly, a container, a chair, a house, its essence has to be explored, for it should serve its purpose to perfection, i.e., it should fulfill its function practically and should be durable, inexpensive, and beautiful. As with all counsel of perfection, this one is not especially useful. No one would argue that a chair should not fulfill its function practically, that it should not be durable, or that it should be costly or ugly, but somebody might argue that it is unnecessary to explore the essence every time. At least, somebody has argued that, namely C. Northcote Parkinson, the author of Parkinson's Law. Life is too short, Parkinson said. When asked to design a chair, the designer shouldn't sit down and gaze at the sky, saying, What is a chair? What are the elements of the problem? What is the true philosophy of the problem? What is the true philosophy of chair-making? It all takes too long, and costs too much, and the result is horrible anyway. Better to agree together on what a chair is. At the end of it, one designer will obviously be better than another. Parkinson wasn't suggesting that we already know what a chair is all about. He was suggesting that designers don't know, but ought to find out, ought to establish some consensus on what a chair means, so that design could proceed as a professional discipline, a professional discipline being one that some body of knowledge upon which there is qualified agreement. But the function of a chair is not all that easy to establish. Some years ago, a friend of mine praised a chair she owned with the remark, it is a very good chair for sitting. At the time, that seemed a strange feature to single out. Sitting, I thought, is what a chair is for. But it isn't, not necessarily. The function of a chair may be to fill a corner, dress up a room, keep a table from looking unattended, organize space, impress people, depress people. Even when the function of chair is sitting, there is considerable latitude in how that requirement is to be met. A chair may be designed for elegant sitting, for long-term sitting, for brief sitting, for comfortable sitting, for calculatedly uncomfortable sitting, for seating, which is uncomfortable sitting in large numbers. Even chairs that are designed primarily for sitting obviously are used for many other things. Exercise, play, drying clothing, storing objects, making love. Often, the true function of a chair is symbolic. If a man's home is his castle, then a man's chair is his throne. The gospel according to Archie Bunker is most authoritatively delivered from the nerve center of the household, his easy chair. The director's chair is practical in that it can be easily moved from studio set to location, but that is not its real practicality. The movie industry spends millions of dollars moving heavy equipment around all the time, and could haul chairs as easily as it hauls cameras and cranes. The function of the movie director's chair is to carry the name of the director. That's why we all like them, although they can be held as sit-in. Our most common chair symbols are the so-called modern classics. The Barcelona chair, the Vasily and Cheska chairs, 
the Eames leather lounge chair, but the most deeply symbolic chairs probably are those the Goldilocks discovered, and they tell us as much about ergonomics and chair design as most designers know. The story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears expresses a close relationship between person and chair. The moment they stepped into the house, they saw that someone had been there. Oomph, said the Papa Bear in his great big voice. Someone has been sitting in my chair. Notice the indignation and horror. Someone's been sitting in my chair. It suggests a kind of rape, an invasion of something highly personal. And notice, too, that the bear spotted the violation instantly. Even symbolic chairs have to be sat in, and sitting is itself symbolic. So the next time you park your carcass, think very carefully about the way you're doing it.